good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you again uh, as we uh, join together to worship our God, to book in the Lord's Day uh, in worship. Uh, I do want to uh, give you two bits of uh, information uh, that are that are not included in your bulletin. The first one I mentioned this morning that the church office is going to be closed uh, tomorrow due to President's Day. Uh, but also I want to uh, let you all know or to remind you that next Sunday uh, is the fourth Sunday of the month. Um, and that means that we'll have communion during our evening worship service uh, since it's the second month of the year. And so uh, communion will be uh, next Sunday evening. Uh, during our evening worship service. And so we hope that you'll go ahead and begin preparing your hearts for that ordinary means of grace in the life of the church. Uh, of course, there are other announcements there on the back of your bulletin. Uh, please pay careful attention to them. And, and also, don't forget, uh, April 19th through the 21st uh, will be our 125-year uh, celebration, uh, hopefully uh, this week or next, we'll be getting the full schedule out with all of our details of the celebration weekend. But uh, you'll see for the remainder of the year, we'll have our 100, celebrating 125 years uh, there on the cover of our bulletin to remind ourselves of the Lord's faithfulness to us uh, and then anticipating the continued faithfulness of our Lord for generations to come. Well, our call to worship this evening comes from Psalm 120. Two, a psalm of David, reading verse 1. So if you will, stand as you are able and let's enter into God's presence together. As the psalmist says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Well, uh, as our hearts are glad, it's fitting for us to sing. Uh, and so if you'll take your hymn books out, we have two psalms uh, this evening. And our first one is Psalm 46a, Psalm 46a, uh, and so let's sing all five verses together.
us pray. Our Father, our God, who is our certain and sure defense in the midst of storms, in the midst of everything, in the midst of life, that one certainty we have, Lord, is in you, in your promises, in your oath, and who you are, Lord, you with whom it is impossible for you to lie. Uh, Lord, we can always and must, and we pray will always trust in you, for you will certainly bring everything that you have promised to pass. You will always be good. Uh, you are always worthy of our trust and our praise. Our Father, we pray that you would be with us this evening uh, as we come to worship you. Uh, we pray that, uh, Lord, you would meet us here as you are a loving Father and uh, Lord, as you promised to be with us as we gather together in your name. So we do come, Lord, and we come in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you would uh, remain standing, if you would turn over in your hymn book, uh, just a few pages to uh, our Psalm of the Month, uh, Psalm 34C, through all the changing scenes of life, uh, of course, based off the 34th, or really, uh, the words put to song, the 34 Psalm, uh, but 34 C, and Miss uh, Miss Becky Coleman, if you would please uh, play it through one time, and then we'll join in and stand and remain standing and sing this together. <laughs> seated. Well, if you don't have a bulletin, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, if you do have a bulletin, please open to uh, page, I can't tell what this is, four? Um, page four, but our, our uh, corporate affirmation of faith is printed on page four. Uh, it comes from the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 45, and we're going to be confessing our faith about the fact right now that Christ uh, is the king of the universe. Um, our Lord is not one who has ascended and, and is waiting to reign. Uh, he reigns now. He is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. And yes, one day he will come where every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But even now, he does reign. And he reigns ordinarily uh, through so-called ordinary means, through our civil magistrates and through other uh, 
governances and so forth that he himself has ordained. So again, we will confess together. Uh, I will ask the question then together. We'll confess uh, the bold print together about how our Lord is king uh, even now. Uh, So the question is, how doth Christ execute the office of a king? Christ executeth the office of a king in calling out of the world a people to himself and giving them officers, laws, and censures by which he visibly governs them in bestowing saving grace upon his elect, rewarding their obedience, and correcting them for their sins, preserving and supporting them under all their temptations and sufferings, restraining and overcoming all their enemies, and powerfully ordering all things for his own glory and their good, and also in taking vengeance on the rest who know not God and obey not the gospel. Amen. Well, uh, we've come quickly to this uh, time in our service of congregational uh, of congregational selections for hymns and psalms. So again, if you have a Uh, something that you'd like us to sing from the Psalter hymnal, from our hymn book, uh, go ahead and uh, raise your hand or shout it out or whatever. 252, 252. 252. This is my Father's world. Uh, 252. And uh, let us uh, remain seated and uh, express our trust and Faith in our Lord, singing, uh, This is my Father's world. We'll sing all three verses. Time for another one. 459. My hope is built on nothing less. 459. Uh, Singing of, of course, the Lord Jesus, his blood and righteousness. Uh, 
Let us uh, sing together and remain seated again and sing to the Lord uh, this hymn. God in prayer together. Hey, baby. <laughs> Father in heaven, we do give you much thanks for you are a God who has befriended us and you are a God who has redeemed us despite ourselves and despite our unworthiness. And you are a God, Lord, who heals the brokenhearted and mends up their wounds and forgives those who come to you in repentance and faith. And so we exclaim along with the prophet Micah, who is a God like you and there is no other, a God who passes over our iniquities and forgives us of our sins and cares for us with your sovereign and almighty providence. And so Lord, we come adoring your name for the good God who you are. We come adoring you for who you are, Father, Son, and Spirit, and the salvation in which you bring to us, that we have access to the Father through the salvation that the atoning blood of Jesus Christ the Son brings, and now by the power of the Spirit we come boldly into the throne room of mercy, knowing that we have every right to be here, and we have every invitation to come. Lord, you have told us time and time again, come all who are weary and heavy laden, come all who are thirsty and drink, come all unto Jesus who would believe, and there we will find rest and water and bread for our souls. And so we come, Lord, we put ourselves under your care as you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we, and we trust uh, in your visible governing over us. We thank you, Lord, for those laws and in those ways that you have restrained sin on this side of heaven. We thank you for the officers of this church that govern and watch over our souls. And we thank you, Lord, that in your goodness to us, that not only have you called us to obedience as Christians, but you reward our obedience and you correct us when we stray in our ways. 
Father, we are a thankful people for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit because it shows His activity in and through us, that You are making us more like Christ, that You are conforming us more into the image of Your Son. You are enabling us to put to death sin in our life and to pursue Christ's likeness and walk in the power of the Spirit. Father, we are a people who would be first to confess that we fall short of Your standard, constantly in our lives we strike out against your ways we are guilty of what we would often call sins of omission and commission and yet lord in your mercy and in your long sufferingness you have been patient with us and you have comp- and you have continued to do the work of glorification in our life called sanctification and so lord we do Uh, Thank you for the good work that you have started, and we cling to the promises that the good work that you have started, you will bring about to its completion. And Lord, we do long for the day of the consummation of your kingdom, even as we'll see those things unfolding before us in Zechariah chapter 14, we pray, Lord, that we would yearn even more for the day of Christ's second return, that we would yearn for the day in which your kingdom is consummated in its fullness. And that we would yearn for the day, Lord, that we are in your presence with you unhinderedly. Right now we see in just shadows and in types. And yet, uh, Lord, there will be a day uh, that we see you. And on that day we will be like you, holy, blameless, and righteous. And, And so, Lord, we do pray along with the Apostle John that you would come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. For we feel the the weight of this sin-filled world. Not only do we feel the the cultural winds blowing against us as a church and as Christians, but we feel the consequences of sin in our bodies that continue to break down and continue to ache and continue to grow sick and uh, and many different things. And so, Lord, we we do pray uh, that you would uh, heal up our wounds, that you would Uh, cast away any infirmities within us, and yet at the same time we pray for wisdom for our doctors and skill for our surgeons uh, and effectiveness for medications. Uh, We we pray, Lord, that uh, these things would be a common grace for us, that we would even see the wisdom of our doctors as a gift from your hand, and yet we long for the day where these things are no longer needed. We, We long for the day, Lord, that there is no more sickness or pain. Uh, and long, Lord, we, we long for the day that there is no more death. We, we know, uh, Lord, that there are people within our church family who are mourning the loss of loved ones even this evening. And we pray, Lord, that you would be close to them by your Spirit who is the Comforter. And that they would be assured, Lord, that they have a right to grieve for they will miss their father and their grandfather. Uh, and, and yet, uh, we as Christians don't grieve like those who have no hope. Uh, For we have a hope in the resurrection in which Christ brings. And so for the believer, death has no more sting and the grave has no victory. Uh, And Lord, we we do uh, yearn for the day where the grave is ultimately defeated and even our bodies will be resurrected from the ground uh, and sin, death, and the evil one will be thrown into uh, the fiery lakes of hell. Uh, Father, we do pray for our time in... Uh, Your word, we pray, Lord, that it would be edifying to us, uh, that we would have understanding in it, that even as we think about this last chapter of the book of Zechariah, the next couple of weeks, that you would uh, allow us to take what we have learned uh, in these many weeks in this prophecy, and that we would be able to, by the power of your Holy Spirit, apply it to our daily living. We pray, Lord, that it would Convict where it ought to convict, encourage where it ought to encourage. We pray, Lord, that it would shine further light into the dark places and that, uh, Lord, it would cause us to rejoice, uh, knowing that your promises are sure, for they have their yes and amen in your Son and our Savior, Jesus. And so, Lord, we, we know that we need help to understand and apply your word rightly, and so we ask for even more of your Spirit. You tell us. Uh, Lord, that if we need more, simply ask, and our Father in heaven will give it. And so we we need more of your Spirit, Lord, so that we might hear this, your word. 
And we do thank you for it, this word that is perfect, infallible, and full of authority for our lives. So may we care, pay careful attention to it. And we pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, if you will, uh, open your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 14. We are going to uh, start our full exposition of this last chapter. This evening we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. And then, Lord willing, uh, next week we'll handle the rest of the chapter, verses 12 through 21. But tonight, Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. And just as you turn there, let me go ahead and, and prep us for what's going to take place here in this last chapter. Because Zechariah is very concerned as a prophet of God, as a spokesperson of God. He wants to encourage the people uh, that he has been called to minister to and to lead. And so he wants to, one, as we saw last week if you were with us, he wants them, one, to have a realistic expectation of the Christian life. He wants them to know that hardships, trials, tribulations, sufferings will come. But at the very same time, Christ will preserve his church, actually grow his church, and will bring it all the way to its consummation at his second coming. And so what is happening here is that essentially Zechariah is looking at his audience and he is saying, does the uncertainty of the future seem to bother you? And if we were to think about that question, we would say absolutely. Uncertainty of the future bothers us. Uh, not knowing what will take place causes us anxiety. Uh, and actually, what, what Zechariah seems to be saying here, seems to be arguing here in Zechariah 14, is that the uncertainty about the future that you are holding on to changes the way you live right now. I remember when I was telling a story about Brooks being born this morning. I have another story about Brooks being born this evening. Because after all things had settled down and uh, Nurse Mary, uh, you know, had everything uh, in control and, and the nurses were in and we were delivering and uh, Brooks was born and he was getting sent back, I think, for some, some blood work or a bath or something of the sort. I, I checked my email, you know. I shouldn't have, but I did. I checked my email, and I had, a, I had an email from Dr. Kelly. Uh, one, it was one of the most beautiful written emails I've ever read in my life. Uh, but one of the phrases in there, don't parent out of fear. And I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. How would I parent out of fear? And I began to think about that. And I began to continue to read. Don't parent out of fear, but parent out of faithfulness. And I thought, well, okay. It comes from Dr. Kelly. I think this is going to matter something towards me. But let me consider what he's trying to say. Because when we parent out of fear, we begin to mistrust or be overbearing. But when we are faithful, we lead as we are called to lead according to the scriptures as fathers or in mothers. And we pray for them. Uh, and we disciple them, and, and we leave the rest over to the Lord. It's, it's just faithfulness. Don't parent out of fear, but parent out of faithfulness. If you parent out of fear, it changes the way that you parent in that hour, in that day, in that week, in that month. But when we parent in faithfulness, it changes the way in which we go about raising our children. I think that what Zachariah is trying to get to here is... Be faithful, don't live in fear. Do things out of faithfulness and not in fear. Because what happens here is that Zechariah, knowing the fear that, the, that his audience is holding on to, he begins to tell them the end of the story. Growing up in the Pentecostal church, we were always rem reminded by the preacher, I know how the story ends. And that's exactly what Zechariah is trying to establish here. You as Christians, you know how the story ends. And so Zechariah has already been pointing the believers forward to the cross of Christ and his atoning death and his resurrection. But now he's going to push them even farther. The story doesn't end at Christ's death. It doesn't end at his resurrection. It doesn't end at his ascension even. It ends 
on the coming day of the Lord when He returns to usher in His kingdom, the heavens, this new heavens and this, this new earth. And what He says here is that it should change the way in which you live right now. Not only, Zechariah says in chapters 12 and 13, do we change the way we live in light of the cross of Christ, but we actually change the way we live in light of the second coming of Christ. And we do that because we can be sure, we're guaranteed that the Lord will come again even in the midst of severe affliction. And so, Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 11 is our text. And let us read it together. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the, women's, uh, the women raped. Half of the city shall go into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when He fights on a day of battle. And on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. So that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azel. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost, and there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea, and it shall continue in summer as in winter." And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one, and his name one. The whole land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate to the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananel to the king's winepress. And it shall be inhabited, for there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. Where the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever and ever. In this uh, 11 verses, there's three things that I want to draw our attention to. Uh, And the first is simply, in verses 1 through 5, the return of Christ. The return of Christ in verses 1 through 5. You can let your eyes fall there as I remind you that throughout this book, the prophet Zechariah has been encouraging the people of God not only to return to Jerusalem after their captivity in Babylon, but he has actually encouraged them to rebuild and to resettle the city. We know because we have Ezra and Nehemiah who go along who parallel somewhat of this timeline found here in Zechariah, that the foundations of the temple have already been built and the walls have been started. And yet Zechariah is trying to encourage the people to continue on in this labor so that they can rebuild what used to be present before Nebuchadnezzar wiped it all out in the Babylonian captivity. And so as he's encouraged them... He has told them about this coming Messiah, this shepherd king, if you've been with us the past number of weeks, this great shepherd of the sheep, the Lord Jesus Christ, how he comes and he lays down his life and he completes the work by his atoning death. And at that moment, when we put ourselves in the shoes of the original hearers, it doesn't seem that magnificent, does it? That this promised king, this shepherd will come Uh, And he will lay down his life to complete the work. Because what has been happening throughout the the history of Jerusalem as they've been trying to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city is they, as many commentators have said, and we've said before, they've had plow in one hand and sword in the other. 
They have been working and yet they have been fearful of the nations that have surrounded them. And so they've been constantly looking over their shoulder, trying not to die. And now the prophecies have told us that there will be one who will come to die. And he will be resurrected again. And then the work of the establishment of the kingdom will be complete. It's, it's far beyond their human understanding. And, and as Zechariah begins to preach this kind of last message here in chapter 14, what is far beyond their understanding uh, now begins to seem somewhat discouraging, doesn't it? Because they've been laboring, they've been working. Zechariah has called them to faithfulness and, and diligence as, as they carry on trying to rebuild the temple, trying to rebuild the city, resettle these homes. And then in verses 1 and 2, these disturbing words come out of the prophet's mouth. A day is coming, and the spoil is going to be taken from you. It's going to be divided right between your eyes. The nations who surround you, they will gather against you, and the city shall be taken, and the houses will be plundered, and your women will be abused. And, and all of this is going to take place where only half of the city remains. Well, Zechariah, why are we working so hard? Why have you called us to continue to rebuild? Why, why are you telling us this discouraging news and yet, Zechariah not only points to the remnant, there will be half of you who remain. Remember, even as we handle chapters 12 and 13, there's a remnant that continues to remain faithful to the Lord. Zechariah is pointing to this remnant again. There will be some who will remain, some who will reach the pinnacle, the climax of God's redemptive story, but there will be those who are cut off. There will be those who... The nations will crush. And, and it seems as if there is no hope at all in our days. You know, we can think about that and we can say, it surely seems like there is this rejection, opposition, hostility, violence, exclusion. Even what Zechariah is trying to point to here is that there is another exile that is soon to come for you. And we can feel that this, this opposition and this hostility should discourage us. It, it should be heavy upon our shoulders. It should cause us to, to wonder what is the Lord doing in the midst of all of this affliction, in the midst of all of this darkness. You know, the, the nations hate the Lord. The nations hate the Lord's people. The nations hate the Lord's city. And, and they are going to come in and they are going to destroy. You parallel that with today's time. And the world hates our Lord Jesus. And the world hates Christianity. And the world hates the church. And, and these parallels continue to exist. And, and, and verses 1 and 2 should cause you to feel the, the, the weariness of this original audience. It should disturb you to the point where you go, what in the world is, is happening? What is going to take place to bring any sort of hope or assurance of salvation? Where is the Lord in all of this? And if you look back at verse 3, here is the Lord. Then the Lord, remember the then, the, the then, that's a little bit of a tongue twister, but the then is showing us in, in the lowest of points, in the darkest of valleys, in the greatest of afflictions, it's then that the Lord will go out and fight against the nations. It's then that He will fight on a day of battle. It's then, in verse 4, that His feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives and the mountain be split and a valley made so that the remnant that remains can find safety, security, shelter under the care of their Lord. It's here in the midst of all this affliction that Zechariah says, I know it seems discouraging. And I know it seems overwhelming. And I know I sound pessimistic, but it's then, in your lowest of points, in your greatest of weaknesses, that the Lord will prove Himself to be a mighty warrior. 
The Lord will prove Himself to be your mighty God who keeps His promises. Not only will He come in to to crush the nations, the enemies of His Son and, and the enemies of the church and the enemy of His people, but He will do it in a way where they don't even have to fight. He comes in and He goes to battle and He is the one that wins the fight. They just get to sit under the care of His almighty wings. And in the way in which Zechariah writes here, we have to understand that it's apocalyptic. We we have to understand that this is end times writing, so everything doesn't have to be literal. It's very illustrative. You know, when when we talk about Revelation, I, I, I talk about how how John the Apostle, he's grasping at English words. He, he, can't, he can't fully describe what he's seeing, and so he's using things like similes. It's, it's like sapphire, it's as if I'm looking at diamonds. It's bright like fire, and it's gorgeous like a rainbow. It's like this, it's like that. It's, 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 he's trying to find anything and everything in the, in the language that he knows to, to describe what is taking place. And so when Zechariah is talking about this, he's doing the very same thing. The Mount of Olives, while it might literally split, it's apocalyptic language. We, we don't think that it's going to literally split on the day of the Lord when he returns to defeat Satan sin and death for all eternity, but, but Zechariah's point, what Zechariah's seeing and what he's trying to articulate for his hearers is that the Lord God will come and He will move heaven and earth to protect His children. That He will do whatever it takes to protect His people, to conquer His enemies, to serve as their king and to usher in His kingdom forever and ever. And you notice the way in which Zechariah writes about these things in verse 5. This this earthquake is going to come and he is going to move and recreate all of creation so that his people might dwell securely in it and he will come. The Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. And so he sees the angels and the, the saints that have gone before us and he sees the Lord being ushered in to creation, landing there on the Mount of Olives, the same mountain that he ascended from, may we add. And, and it's this reestablishment of the new heavens and the new earth. And this causes such joy in the heart of Zechariah, assurance in the heart of Zechariah, no matter what we might say. Zechariah is overflowing with good news here. That in the midst of our roughest afflictions, in the midst of the darkest of places, the Lord is going to show up on the scene and He is going to make all things new. He's so assured of the promises of God that He says, then the Lord, my God, He breaks character. Remember, the prophets are are mouthpieces for the Lord. They're, They're speaking on behalf of the Lord. And so they say, thus says the Lord, and then they speak what they have been told to speak. And in the same way, Zechariah is is speaking of all these things in a prophetic sense, all these things that are going to take place, and he breaks character. He breaks forth in praise. The Lord my God is going to come. I'm not speaking on behalf of God. I'm just so excited that the Lord's coming, that He's going to make all things new again. And and that little break of character should, should cause us to to consider, I think, have we, have we thought enough about the good news that Jesus is going to return again? When I was, when Pastor Don and myself actually were teaching through Thomas Watson, the Puritan's work, the godly man's picture, probably one of the most gripping characteristics of the godly man in Thomas Watson's work was that the godly man was a heavenly man. That he was constantly thinking about how the Lord is going to return again. How the Lord is preparing us for an eternal home. How the Lord is going to wipe away every tear from our eye. How all the things of the world is fleeting. And yet our God is creating for us a dwelling place where we can be with Him eternally. All these things were 
flowing through the mind of the godly man, Thomas Watson says. And it was, it was gripping because it was convicting. I don't think about heaven and the coming of the king as much as I should. And Zechariah is pushing his people to think about these things, to see these things, and, and then to break forth in praise and adoration and obedience because the Lord, my God, will come and all the holy ones of heaven with him. But because we have to push on here, if you look down at verses 6 and 7, not only will Christ come again, but there will be a renewal of creation. It says, On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost, and there shall be a unique day, a singular day, which is known only to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. Now, verse 6 is, is, is tricky. Verse 6 has some, some Hebrew in it that, that is not found anywhere else in all of our Old Testament. Most scholars would actually argue that it's a a, a blend between Hebrew and Aramaic and and maybe even if your Bibles have footnotes or little subnotes of the sort. uh, Mine does. It says, the meaning of the Hebrew is uncertain. That's the scholarly way of telling you I have no clue what this is saying. So I tried. (laughs) I gave it a shot. Not as good at Hebrew anymore. Uh, but, but, But I was digging into... Uh, this, this text, and, and I agree with one pastor that I was reading, try to wrestle with the text. I actually think it should read something of, uh, and on that day there shall be no more light, nor any more precious ones, because they will literally congeal or, or dim. And, and I think what the, the prophet Zechariah is trying to get to here is that there will be no more sun, moon, or stars as the new creation is being made on that day, that unique day where where all of the old creation, broken by sin, tainted by sin is no more, and and this new heavens and this new earth is is created for God's people. There's no more lights. Remember Genesis 1, as, as God is creating the heavens and the earth, He creates the sun and the moon and the stars, the sun to give light during the day and the moon and stars to give light at night and all throughout the scriptures places like Isaiah 13:10 Joel 13:15 Matthew 24:29 I can't take time to to dissect those verses for you but again if you want to look at them later it's Isaiah 13:10 Joel 13:15 Matthew 24:29 it speaks of this day of tribulation this this time of affliction And as the Lord appears, darkness settles in and then new light comes. And isn't that the same language that's there before us in verse 7? But at evening time, at its darkest point, it's essentially saying there shall be light. And you're saying, well, Matt, you're saying the sun, the moon, the stars, they're all going out. So who is the light or what is the light? And it goes back to what John sees in the book of Revelation as he sees the new heavens and the new earth. He says in Revelation 21, 23, that city in which I saw had no need for a sun or a moon because the glory of God is its light and the lamp is the lamb. That is the light of heaven. It's the glory of Christ. When we were... Looking at Hebrews chapter 1 during the Christmas season, we said that Jesus Christ was the radiance of the glory of God. That radiance is what lights the new heavens and the new earth. And then you look at verse 8, it says, On that day living waters shall flow out of Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea, and it shall continue in summer as it is in winter. The most pleasant climate, you might say, is there in heaven. And the living waters shall flow out of that celestial city. It's a, it's a glimpse, a taste, you might say, of, of the new creation that we can hold to even, even now. But it's not just a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth, but very quickly it's the restoration of the city. Remember, you circle back to how we, how we began because 
Zechariah has called the people to faithfulness and they're rebuilding the city. They're rebuilding the temple. All of these things. Be faithful. Carry on. Fight the good fight. Continue working. I know it's laborsome. I, I know it's difficult. I know that you're living in fear. Be encouraged because Christ is going to bring about the completion of this city. And it's going to be so much more grand than anything that you could build with your hands. It's going to be a restoration of a city that is very secure and it's going to be glorious. Again, there in verses 9, 10, and 11, this city, this kingdom will be presided over by the Lord. And on that day it says, He will be one and His name one. Well, you would say, well, Matt, the, the, the young Jews, because of Deuteronomy 6, recited the Shema. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. What is Zechariah trying to get to here? He is not trying to deny the Trinity. Okay, uh, He is not trying to deny that our God exists, Father, Son, and Spirit. He's saying that our God will be unrivaled. That there will be no more false gods being worshipped. There will not be any sort of personal vendettas. There will be no enemy to stand against Him. He will be the only and the singular King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. His name will be unparalleled and His city also will be unparalleled because if you look at verse 10, it says, and it will remain aloft on its site, meaning that it has the place of, of, of military strategy. It has the military advantage of being at the highest point. Everything else will be made plains around it. The way that it reads from Gibba to Ramon is showing you what these, what these Jews would think is, boy, that's, that's the far corners of the earth. Everywhere the eye can see is flat and the city of God sits upon a hill. Because it shows its power, its might, its prestige. It shows that no one and no thing can conquer it or even try to ascend the hill to bring about its destruction. It is a security. That's what that last, what, five words within our text, the last five words of chapter, or verse 11, Jerusalem shall dwell in security. That is what's being displayed there in verse 10. That it shall be inhabited by God's people and there will never again be a decree of utter destruction. There will be nothing and no thing that can touch it is essentially what Zechariah is promising. And, and so the encouraging message here, even though verse 1 and 2, you felt the weight of discouragement, the encouragement is... That the Lord is doing far more than we could ever understand or imagine. The Lord is doing far more in sending this King of Kings, Jesus Christ Himself, to reign upon His throne as far as the eye can see. The, the Lord is doing something here in our midst. And when it seems as if all hope is gone, and it seems as if we are going to be utterly destroyed, that's when, it says, Jesus will appear onto the scene and He will cast away every burden. He will heal every pain. And He will mend the brokenhearted. And He will wipe the tears from all eyes. And He will give the springs of living water. And He will give the light into the dark places. And He will be our security. And so Zechariah wants us to to think towards, to yearn for the day that Christ returns. For we will be a people who, who are no longer residents of a world of sin and misery, full of fear and doubt. But we will be a people who belong to the consummated kingdom of Christ. And He will be our King. And He will be our destiny. And He will be our security. And so... Zechariah is telling the nation of, of Israel at this point, don't think about yesterday, don't think about today, and don't even think about tomorrow. 
look towards, be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, where the sword is no longer needed, for Jesus will come and He will destroy His enemies and we will rest in His protection and salvation the rest of our days. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the opportunity to come to this, your word, and we pray, Lord, that we would be encouraged by it, that in the midst of the darkest of times, Lord, you are present, and, and, and on that day, the day in which only the Father knows, when, when, when sin has run its course, uh, you will split the eastern sky and return for your people. And on that day, your kingdom will be inaugurated and your kingdom will be consummated and we will dwell with you securely. And Lord, we do long for that day. Let, let us be heavenly minded people yearning for the day where all of these sins and their consequences are no more, but we get to dwell with you richly forever and ever. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, as uh, we come to a close of our Lord's Day, um, we're going to have the benediction, and then after the benediction, the congregational response, which of course is the first verse of Psalm 117, printed there in your bulletin, to the tune of all creatures of our God and King. Let me pronounce the Lord's blessing to us. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.